consultants shows the upper portion of the site in red with low sensitivity, uh, the middle portion in orange has medium sensitivity, and the lower uh, portion of the site in yellow, which is low sensitivity. Uh, the child anatomy working for us has looked at this and is in broad agreement with um, the conclusions of the developers, landscape experts, although in her view, the site, uh, all the site has medium sensitivity. In particular, the site is uh, visible from location uh, 2B high, which is indicated on this diagram with an arrow which is a view from the adjoining field, which is one of the fields that has been offered as public open space. So at the moment, it's technically private land. And this is a diagram that I produced myself, and it is an overlay of the parameters plan, um, the, the parameters plan for land use overlaid onto that sensitivity diagram. The brown line indicates the sense of the, um, the physical development, and as you can see, uh, it uh, overlaps a little bit onto the red area at the top of the site, albeit the illustrative plan shows the dwelling is built up to the 150 metre contour line, so slightly below that brown line, but slightly overlapping it as well. You saw this slide before, this is a constraint plan just showing the number of TPO trees along the southwest boundary and a, a thin area of flood zone 3 where there is a stream running through the gully to the north of the site. This is a summary of the application proposals uh, which I won't go into and set out in the report. So you will have seen it last time around. These are the parameters plans. Land use, density, scale, access to movement, and open space. And this is the illustrative master plan showing the uh, likely way in which the uh, site could be developed for housing with uh, areas of open space at the top of the site and the bottom of the site, and the three adjoining fields being offered as public open space. Maturity. These are the mood boards that you saw before. These are the detailed access plans that, that members, um, members that attended the site visit, so you would have seen at the site visit, and uh, I talked you through them at the site visit. This is a photo of Pinland Meadow Drive, where there's existing car parking uh, on street. And one of the pinch points at the moment where uh, it's difficult for large vehicles to uh, gain access to the uppermost part of Pinland Meadow Drive at the Spruce Place. This is the drainage layout. The consultees, this remains the same as the last committee, the one difference being the Devon Wildlife Trust withdrew its objection, which we were expecting at the last committee, and it's just the officer had been on the at the time. Um, as you know, there have been a high number, high number of objections from the residents. Uh, the issues raised uh, can be seen on this slide, and you, we went through those in the last committee, so I won't go through them again, but we can always scroll back to them if you want to see them during the questions. Uh, and this is taken from the Developers uh, Landscape Commission Impact Assessment. This is showing the theoretical visibility zone, uh, not accounting for uh, buildings, vegetation that might be in the way. These images taken from the OBIA. Uh, top, uh, top image is the, obviously the summer view, and the bottom image is the Winter view. This is the view from uh, the field to the northeast of the site that's been proposed as public open space in perpetuity, which our landscape architect consultant uh, uh, disagreed with the developers and considered that 
from this vision point, um, the site would be um, quite visible, albeit she made the point that at the moment it's accessible at the gift of the landowner. In these views, it's pretty difficult to see the site because it's hidden behind the existing vegetation. And these are the photo montages that you saw last time around from some key viewpoints and with some zoomed in images um, with uh, parts of the run indicated in red. And the key conclusion of the LAA is that uh, from these long distance views, the site will be partially screened by existing vegetation and it won't breach the, uh, won't be on the ridge line, won't breach the skyline. So this is a list of updates since uh, the last committee. Uh, members carried out site visit, uh, as you know, on the 28th of September. Uh, as I just mentioned, one of our trustees withdrawn its objection. The applicant dismissed a statement responding to issues raised by Councillor Walcott at the last committee, and they also submitted a briefing note by the planning consultant addressing the safe policy of us one of the CCP 16, relevant appeal decisions, Home Farm and Cliss Road, and the High Court judgment in relation to Home Farm. Some points taken from um, our landscape architects uh, report which has been appended to the uh, officer report um, obviously i've picked out some paragraphs here uh, and in bold i'll just read out what it says the ability to obtain views from the site views on the site for public locations are extremely limited and current site access is at the gift of the landowner development as proposed could report with the objectives of policy as well of the extra local plan first review of policy CP, CP16 on the extra core strategy and the addition of the three fields north and west of the site for unhindered quiet recreation and perpetuity will contribute to the public enjoyment and access to the urban fringe. This will be highly beneficial. Um, careful detailed site analysis has shown that the parts of fields one and two that form this application on the revised illustrative master plan are so well related to the urban fringe that they can be developed without unacceptably impacting on the policy objectives of the core strategy. Uh, she's made the point that this, this development wouldn't set a precedent in terms of other sites that we're currently dealing with in the landscape setting area. That should the site be consented, our planning and reserve matters application could and should deliver the design and landscape enhancement objectives, both policy DG1 of the local plan first review and paragraph 130 of the MPPA. And uh, the final paragraph, uh, the effects of the proposed development have been assessed by the LBA author and through a review and found to be very localised, having a moderate impact on the value of landscape characteristics and minimal impacts on views from within the landscape and on the setting of the city. Both sites within the context of retained traditional hedge banks will allow the development to be relatively smoothly assimilated into the local landscape. Uh, another key update, as members will know, the council now has a five year housing land supply. Uh, this removes the tilt of balance as part of the presumption in favour of sustainable development in paragraph 11 of the MPPF. However, the overall conclusion of uh, offices is the same as the last uh, recommendation, and that the proposed development accords with the development plan as a whole, taking into account the policies that remain up to date, bearing in mind the MPPF 21 states. Uh, when it comes to existing policies that were adopted before, the MPPF, due weight should be given to them according to their degree of consistency with the framework. Close to the policies and the plans, the policies and the framework will raise the weight that may be given. Uh, one change, uh, as uh, noted in the committee report, is that the proposed condition for a travel plan has been removed, uh, as it's covered by the £500 per dwelling contribution that's been agreed towards the travel plan in the area. So the officer recommendation is to grant planning permission subject to a legal agreement under section 106 of the Town Energy Planning Act to secure the following the adjoining fields to become a public open space, Straight New Valley Park, and a landscape and ecological management plan to manage it, the management company to maintain and 
manage public open space on the site, including the proposed leaf and lamp. 35% for housing in accordance with adopted policy CP7, which creates 32 dwellings if the maximum 93 dwellings are delivered. And a financial contribution from 0.55 of the dwelling towards off site for housing. £90,000 towards bus services, and £93,000 towards walking and cycling measures in the area, £46,500 towards travel planning in the area, £15,000 towards traffic regulation orders, at just under £331,000 towards new secondary provision of South West Exeter, £54,000 towards patient space and GB surgeries in the area. 13,000 towards upgrade and flood lighting, provision of seating, tea shelves, meeting points at Pendragon Road and Arena Park, Muggers and Arena Skate Park. Uh, and the conditions, the recommended conditions, are set out in the planning committee report. Thank you, members. Thank you, uh, Matt. Before I move on, we'd like to thank the standing orders. I've got to mention at the top of the meeting. Peter Kingsby is here today from the Oaks Observer and he may be taking photos just so you're aware if there's a disruption. Uh, moving on, Councillor Arcock, you are here to speak under standing order number 44. Can I ask you to come forward, please? <coughs> oh, sorry, just a minute. Would anybody like any clarification questions from Matt? Not necessarily. I think he covered everything in his report. Yes. <laughs> You don't have any time scales to work with, but if we did hear you last time, so don't need to come for that, okay? Thank you. Um, thank you, good evening. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging that this is a really sad day for, for the council and the members, and that it is really hard to come in and do business on a, on, a, on a day like this. So thank you all for being here. Um, I will try and keep it concise. Um, I want to start by thanking members for voting to defer their decision on this application pending a site visit and for taking the time to talk through the site. Uh, I'm glad that you've had a chance to see the site in context before you make a decision tonight. And I also want to thank the applicant for his response to the issues that I raised at the 6th of September meeting uh, and for providing a briefing on the recent appeal decisions, which I'll refer to as I go through my remarks. I want to start by acknowledging the significant news that we now have housing land supply of at least five years and five months, which, as it says in the committee report, is a shifting context for, for considering uh, applications going forwards. I said last time that the proposed development would be squarely against our vision for Little Exeter, but we don't even need to look forwards to Little Exeter. We can see the misalignment in our already adopted core strategy, which is now considered fully up to date, and which and whose vision sets out a commitment uh, to sustainable growth through maximising the use of previously developed land, uh, building on its strengths and assets by safeguarding the hills to the north and northwest, uh, and addressing the challenges arising from climate change. The proposal before you this evening is for a car-led development, cut off from community amenities, and built on the very land that our vision says will be safeguarded from uh, I will now briefly outline three key ways in which I believe this proposal falls short of our vision, objectives and policies, focusing on environmental and social sustainability before turning to the question of landscape setting. Mitigating climate change is a thread that runs throughout the core strategy. Uh, in objective one, it states uh, that we will uh, maximise the use of previously developed land, encourage high density development in the city centre, and reduce use of fossil fuels. And Objective 5 says that we need to minimise the need to travel and reduce dependency on the car. And CP11 circulates therefore that development should be located and designed so as to minimise and if necessary mitigate against environmental impacts, which aligns with NPFF guidance that new developments should be integrated effectively within, with existing business and community facilities to reduce our dependency. As members saw on their site visit, the proposed site is up steep hills in both directions, which would make walking and cycling or anything other than recreation quite difficult. The nearest train station is 22 minute walk away, and the current bus route is extremely limited. This development would therefore increase. 
increased car dependency and worsened environmental impacts. The submitted, tra uh, submitted transport assessment shows that it would create queuing on some of the turning maneuvers at Beacon Junctions, which would have an implication on Beacon Lane, and in my view, uh, safety issues on very narrow roads. To mitigate this, the applicant has provided measures to offset car use, which include financial contributions to improve walking and cycling infrastructure, and a contribution to extend the F1 bus route to the development. But I can categorically say that these will not realistically reduce car use or dependency in this context. Firstly, members should note that there is already a bus stop five minutes away from the senior present, and that I have spoken to countless residents who tell me that they cannot use the bus not because the bus stop is too far away, but because it is expensive, unreliable, and follows an extremely limited route. I take on board the applicant's comments that additional users might improve services in the future, but this is entirely subjective and outside of our control. And as a member said at the last meeting, we should not forget that Stagecoach is a private company and operates entirely at their own discretion. Just as they may add, so too could they take away, as we have seen so recently in the area. And secondly, I recognise the benefit of the financial contributions for walking and cycling, but the steep hills mean that while residents might cycle or walk for exercise or recreation, it would be very difficult to use these as alternative modes of transport to get into the city centre, to go to work or to go shopping. So in my view, this hilltop development would increase car use and dependency without sufficient mitigations. The applicant even mentioned that it would be easy to maximise the number of parking spots within the site given its low density, which does not read as sustainable de development to me. So, returning to CP11, I cannot see how this development would minimise or mitigate environmental impacts. Secondly, on social sustainability, it is not enough to build houses, we need to build healthy and well-served communities as well. In our core strategy vision, we aspire to create sustainable communities that are safe places, offering opportunities for everyone, where the environment is respected, and with the housing, amenities, schools, hospitals, and transport links that people need to live well. And again, this is echoed in the NPFF framework, which states that planning decisions should ensure an integrated approach to considering the location of housing, economic uses, and community facilities and services. Certainly, this proposal would offer residents a large parcel of open space that would be managed, likely by a Devon Wildlife Trust, for their recreation. However, as members will surely have seen in their site visit, there are very few other amenities within walking distance of the development, and any such infrastructure is saturated and overstretched. Besides a small local convenience store and a takeaway, there are no local food shops. The nearest supermarket is a minimum 20 minute walk away, which, given the hills, would be unfeasible with shopping bags. The local secondary school does not have any available places and GP surgeries are oversubscribed. The applicant's response to these concerns is that the proposal would provide for financial contributions to infrastructure. And while these may alleviate some pressure on services in the city, I don't believe they will do much to address local pressure points or the deficit in community communities. Financial contributions to already oversubscribed GP practices in the Catherine area would merely cover the additional strain this proposal would put on services. It would not address the fact that even without this, they are already struggling to maintain their caseload. The definition of sustainability is to meet current needs whilst not sacrificing the ability of future generations to meet theirs. And adding 93 houses in an area that has been subject to so many new housing developments in recent years would sacrifice the ability of our current generation to meet their needs, let alone future ones, and it won't achieve Exeter's vision for sustainable, healthy communities. And that brings me to my final point on landscape setting. As we know, the site falls within an area that has been identified as requiring protection <coughs> and development in a succession of documents and policies. It is so important that we protect this land that it was included in our vision statement uh, and it's also mentioned in Objective 8 and Paragraph 4.11 of our core strategy. But despite our stated intention to safeguard this land, we are reminded in the committee report that the Council has approved applications in landscape settings before and lost appeals for development within them. The applicant has provided us a briefing that outlines two such successful appeals at Oak Farm and Cliffs Road. 
This briefing concludes that given the parallels between these sites and Celia present, it would be unreasonable for you to refuse this application on landscape setting grounds. However, while there might be some parallels between these cases in terms of location and landscape sensitivity, that is where the comparison ends. Those decisions were made in the context of a significant housing supply shortfall. Today, we have exceeded the minimum requirement. And I believe that taking those decisions as precedent for this application would be to continue making concessions that we should not be making. Clearly, both the Home Farm and Kids Road appeal decisions were influenced by our housing shortfall, which imposed tilted balance and reduced the of our planning policies. Paragraph 72 of the Home Farm appeal decision states that the current deficit in housing provision and the contribution that the appeal proposal would make in addressing it is a strong material consideration in favour of the appeal proposal. In the same way, that this road appeal concludes that the council has, quote, uh, conceded that to meet the core strategy housing requirement and to achieve a five-year housing land supply, permission would need to be granted on land that is subject to policies LS1 and CP16, and that some adverse effects would be unavoidable. Developing landscape setting land may have progressively been unavoidable in the past, but how can we, in good conscience, continue to make such concessions today when we have in excess of a five-year housing supply? If we accept this proposal, I fear we'll be setting yet another precedent, and where does that end? This proposal clearly conflicts with policy LS1, which prohibits all housing development on landscape setting land, and I can see that we cannot put full weight on this policy due to its diverging from updated guidance and being based on an out what outdated evidence base. However, this conflict was given some weight in recent refusals of the Red Hills and Higher Fields proposals, and I think we must do the same thing here. Policy CP16 is fully up to date, and while this does not prevent all housing development as LS1 does, it couldn't be clearer in its intention to protect landscape setting land from the harmful impacts of development. It says that this site will be protected and the proposals for landscape recreation, biodiversity and educational enhancement brought forward through the Delivery Development Plan. And whilst never adopted, Exeter's Development Delivery Development Management Plan is also a material consideration. DD29 says that, quote, development within landscape setting areas will only be permitted where A, there is no harm on the distinctive characteristics and special qualities of the landscape setting of the city, and B, it does not contribute to the urbanisation of these areas. I would also highlight point E that it should be, quote, demonstrated that there is no suitable alternative sites with less harmful impacts. Officers conclude that the impact that would be caused by this proposal is not severe enough to present the conflict with CP16. Unlike Red Hills and Higher Field, it is not on the ridge line, and the site is described as being in fields that are very well enclosed by existing hedgerows, which provides screening. Therefore, officers determined that while there would be some moderate impact on the immediate surroundings, the overall impact on the city's landscape setting would be minimal. However, while not presenting as severe a harm as other recent applications, this application does present some harm. Locally, some of the hedgerows that currently shield the local field from sight would be removed for access, and despite the replanting plans, will take decades to grow back. Similarly, in the winter, those trees won't be relied upon to provide a visual barrier. And more generally, in my view, even a minimal impact on the city's landscape setting is too much, given the commitment we have made in our policy documents. I believe it also risks encouraging further urbanisation of an area that is still undeveloped. And we cannot demonstrate a lack of unsuitable sites, uh, given the fact that we have met our uh, housing supply requirement and identified in Liverpool Exeter uh, a feasible plan for, for, me, for moving forwards. In the context, I just don't see any justification for conceding to cause even minimal impact to landscape setting land. So finally, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge some of the benefits of this scheme. It would provide for the transfer of three high fields for perpetual community benefit, improved drainage systems would address current flooding issues, Double yellow lines would address visibility issues at pinch points of the road, and of course, it would provide for 32 affordable homes and financial contributions to city infrastructure. 
So the decision for you tonight then is whether this proposal calls for our <laughs> policies, and if it doesn't, whether those benefits are sufficient in justifying it. The provision of the three higher fields is generous indeed, but is it worth losing the bottom two fields to develop them for? The applicant suggests that if this application is denied, the landowner may be required to put cows in the lower fields and prevent access to recreation. But I must emphasise to members that every single resident I have spoken to has told me that they would rather never walk in that field again than see it turn into a concrete forecourt. And I would also draw members' attention to the other significant issues that remain. The serious safety concerns of parents whose homes are no longer open onto a historic green, but a busy two-way road. The loss of open play space in these fruits flows. And of course, the very real concerns that shared by our county councillor Tracy Adams about the extremely narrow roads on both sides of this site that would have to accommodate significant additional traffic, not to mention the passage of construction vehicles. Both access roads would be just 5.5 metres wide, which is the bare minimum shown by the manual of the streets for accommodating two way lorry traffic. So, to conclude, Achieving the housing land supply we have today has involved difficult decisions and sacrifices. We have had to concede to development of our precious green space to deliver the housing that our city needed. But today we have met our minimum housing requirement and have an exciting, sustainable vision in place for moving forward. Let us make no further concessions. And in my view, the housing and sustainability benefits offered by this proposal are not sufficient to outweigh the many ways in which it falls short of our core strategy vision, objectives and policies and I urge committee members to consider refusing this application tonight.
councillors, you must not be intimidated into approving this step development based on the same rattling of found past appeals. The situation is now different. You now have over 100% five-year housing supply. You also have a new government minister whose own MPs are pleading with him to cancel a former policy of building on green land. And even Morris has publicly agreed. You also now have up-to-date policies that surely must be tested so that you can protect the heritage you so rightly speak of. Please stand by your own statements, fight for your policies, reject this development tonight. Thank you. Thank you, I 
application by the developer. So I, I, don't, I can't answer that question 100%, I'm afraid. Okay, I understand that. So I mean, the thing I'm concerned about is in the Development in the city 
which is supported by a good mix of uses, can help residents decide to reduce or abandon their reliance on the cars. So, in summary, there is a policy to support to protect the site from development and improving this application would undermine the protection given to the hills on the fringe of the city within the local plan and core strategy. Approval would also undermine the vision and deliverability of the garden community, which we are all keen on and the council does, I have to reiterate, have a five-year supply. I understand everything else, but me personally, myself and other, I am totally committed to saving the hills around Exeter. As I have said, they are so important to us. It is an important amenity space. We have to protect it for the residents of Exeter. I will be moving after the debate, Chair, rejection. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bionic. Thank you, Chair. Um, two issues really for me. Firstly, um, is the issue of sustainability and how inclusive this development is. And uh, this development still seems to be very, as I think the gentleman said, car driven, which is very much um, true, I think. And it's the same thing that we saw in, there, in the application for the Deals, where um, you, know, it, you, almost have, you do have to have a car, you have to have a car to actually fulfill the normal functions of getting shopping, getting to work on time, you know, doing all the other things that people have to do because, you know, because of the poor bus service, um, you know, which is, which is historically poor in this area, and it's twin is the other side of the river in Exeter, where we both had cuts and, and we have to fight those. Um, and, and particularly at the moment, I, I know things change and things probably will change, but look at the way the bus service is at the moment, with the driver shortage and everything else, it's very unreliable. And, and, and you know, so you can't rely on that. As Councillor Alcock said, um, you know, it's a private concern. We often have very little um, sort of leverage of how it operates, unfortunately. I, I, I won't just talk about renationalising public transport, if we, that you'd be pleased to hear today. However, um, so, so, I, so I think there's almost a, uh, you know, a, 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 a sort of risk assessment that I think you know, we always need to take. We've got disabilities, if you've got small children, push chairs, if you've become elderly, this won't be the development for you. So you know that is the same on any on any level. It's not what we want to encourage. The second concern that I've got on regard in regards to these uh, development contributions that we've got in front of us here, um, you know, in particular, um, it's the same issue that we've got really in West Ex, in Exeter, and, and even parts of St Thomas. Is you know if you've got overflowing medical practices at the moment, where do you spend the money to? You know what's it going? What's, what's the reality of that going to mean? And I see here that it's. £330,000 towards new secondary provision to save West Exeter. Now, I do know the county might have a policy of like a Mexican way where they'll put the money in one area and they'll readjust all the catchment areas so it might work out somewhere along the system. But nevertheless, are, are we really seriously saying, you know, what, how good what is that for you in, in, in Whipton and Minson Lake? Put your money into South West Exeter. We've got our, you know, that's great that we might get some money in South West Exeter, but are we seriously saying it's going to be like a circular bus taking? Your children to the South West because I mean, you know, it's far enough in Exeter to go to St James. I don't know anywhere else. My, my colleagues know we've had enough problems with that one in the past month. Goodness knows. So, so again, I, I think we need to have, have a look at, you know, not only is I don't think this development sustainable, but also have a good look at some of that because I, I, I think it's a bit of a fantasy football game going on there. But I think, you know, the, you know, like we can't spend it, um, you know, because because we're over such a under the capacity, or we're spending it in exactly the wrong part of the city that doesn't need it, um, which would benefit your residents. So, so I think on balance, I would be very happy to second the, the leader's uh, move to refuse on, on those grounds and all of those that he's put down in regards to land supply and the landscape value. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Thank you. Um, yeah, the site visit was very instructive, and um, so I think that's a suggestion. Um, the, I'm, I do agree with the um, development being a car lift development, particularly as it was explained that there will be net gain in car parking spaces off site, which is actually against the um, sustainable transport hierarchy, which is a, a planning policy. Um, I, 
my question about the hubs, the height of the houses, um, I think it will have an impact on the character because unless they're bungalows or they're built in significantly into the hillside, they are going to be able to be seen because the difference in height between the field and the houses in the next door um, is quite significant. So, I, you know, I am um, very concerned about this. And we had a letter from the developer about the standing of policies, but actually um, C60 is indeed to be in um, up to date. So it, because the tilted balance is new to apply because there's a housing supply numbers, I don't think actually um, I think that's perfect thanks to um, also include for with the use of Thank you, Councillor Moore. Um, I'm gonna oh gonna let Councillor Sutton first. Um, and it may well be that even if this was 
um, to be approved and the contribution but they, they may not be in a position to provide um, a bus service because the current circumstances we find ourselves in. But I think um, something could be done and maybe um, some consultations with the county about improving um, the, uh, the access up there with, with the pitch points um, without the need to put the houses there to get the money. Um, so in conclusion, um, I, I do welcome the fact that Mr. Fleur last time. Um, I did find the site was informative and I have now decided that um, I will be voting um, against approval of this. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, this has been quite a challenging application for us all to consider. Um, and I'm also very grateful that the Chair um, suggested a site visit. And um, yes, we did all true friend in, uh, in the rain. In fact, I walked up from Beacon Lane right to the top. And it convinced me that the current sort of areas are not sustainable in there. That's why there are so many car issues. So it's never going to be um, sustainable and it's going to be car led. So that, that became very, very apparent. Um, for a couple of other things I want to mention, I want to thank um, Mr. Tremlett for um, the effort in trying to um, um, resolve this and find a way forward. So that's been very positive, that's the offer of land. The other thing that I, I think we need to also acknowledge is that um, it may only be 32 um, 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 affordable um, houses that were being offered here, but we have 3,200. Um, on the Devon Home Choice waiting list. So I know there were many, many hundreds of, of objections to this, but I think we also have to bear in mind all those hundreds, thousands of people who are seeing these planning applications and they will be supporting it because they're desperate for somewhere to live. So with that in mind, and I'm, you know, the lead council of supporting people, it has been really, really difficult. Uh, but I have to say on balance, I am not going to be supporting this application and it's with a very, very heavy heart. So a thank you to um, the officers for all the efforts um, that they have made to um, make this acceptable, but it just doesn't um, do it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as the local, one of the local members, I think you indulge me for a very short amount of time because I do feel like everything's been said by the right councillor. I don't feel we, we need to say it all over again a million times. Uh, Councillor Olcock made very, very good points. I'm, I'm very impressed. Thank you very much. You're um, probably one of the best we've had to come up. And the second best is probably sat next to you on the bench uh, to come and speak uh, a planning committee. Um, I understand actually the point of view that Councillor Williams has made because I've sat in her seat before. Um, but if I didn't have an alternative plan, if we didn't think there was an alternative way of dealing with this, I might be inclined to the people who are living in houses that are too small or flats that have too many children living in BPPs, I might be inclined to vote for this. But I have to agree that with the tilted balance, with an alternative plan, and given that there are so many flaws in the application, that I could not support it either. So I'm going to take the original. Uh, recommendation to you for votes. I think I know how long they go. And once we get to that point, I think we'll need to have a discussion about what we do moving forward. But could I ask for someone to make the recommendation second on the technicality? Thank you, Councillor uh, Bialik. And Councillor Sutton will second. All those in favour of the current recommendation, which is to approve. All of those against? As such, we will need someone to refuse the application or uh, make the recommendation to second that, and we'll need reasons why. So, in doing that, if you could list some, that would be good. Chair, what we will do, that's what we tend when we do go um, against the officer's recommendation, we generally adjourn and do the right thing for us to bring and sort of bring together, um, make sense of all what we've said, and bring some sort of Perhaps we could um, take a, a physical needs break, actually, for yeah. five minutes to yeah. allow that just to happen. Yeah, and I'll, I'll speak to the officers so we can turn some of those objections into statements. Thank you. Uh, Bear with me to come back in five minutes or so, please.
agenda at the moment. Um, we have some reasons for uh, Barry is going to read those out for us. And then, if you agree, because you may not, but that's which we do agree, we'll move forward with the reasons for the pizza. Thank you, Chair. Given what members have said, I've, I've drafted this uh, one reason for refusal, which hopefully incorporates everything uh, that's been raised as a concern and that led to the resolution. Um, the adopted core strategy sets out an approach which steers development away from the hills that are strategically important to the setting of the city. The local plan sets out a sequential approach to development with greenfield sites at the bottom of the hierarchy. As the council can demonstrate five year housing and supply, greater weight is afforded to its adopted policies. It is considered that development of this site would undermine the spatial approach uh, in the development plan by allowing development on a site which is in an area identified for protection. The proposal is therefore contrary to policy H1 of the local plan and policy CP16 of the core strategy. Thank you. So that's our reason for refusal. All of those, can I have that made a recommendation and seconded? Yeah. Okay, whoever can I think we've got seconded and recommended. Yeah. And can I see all those in favour of refusal for reasons just to give them? Thank you very much. That means that we have refused our application. The next application on the agenda is Clifton Hill Sports Centre, Clifton Hill, Exeter. I will be declaring an interest in this item and Council Williams and Chair. Site. 
and we have commissioned an external liability appraisal of that scheme. We are satisfied with the market demand that student housing and site and members of the committee will be familiar with schemes coming from within the area, for example, on Mount Road recently. We are doing the, the pre application approaches that officers are still receiving from us, both the sites in and around the city centre for the purpose of student accommodation. If members are happy, rather than go through the slide presentation we took through in December, all the four plans are put all the individual units, all the layout of the site. So I'd like an explanation 
work you've done in terms of the market, um, testing and whatever that you've done. What, what is the likelihood then that the private developers would come forward and say, well, you've, you've allowed that development for 42 houses to, to go ahead and they've removed the affordable element. Um, we want to do the same because we can say it's a tough market and we want to make them build some high spec units and it, and it doesn't stack up for us if we put affordable in. As we said, there, there are a number of tests which have to be satisfied to rely on alternative use value, um, and they, they do need to be satisfied. So, yes, they. It's not so much a precedent as there, there is the opportunity to rely on alternative use value. So it's not about accepting this one, you can change the situation, but it's the door to that. There is the potential for somebody to rely on alternative use value. It does need to satisfy the tests. It does need to be policy compliant. Um, in this case, it's relying on it. There does need to be a higher value use that also meets um, you know, this policy compliant. So there would be a limit, very limited number of circumstances that, that is likely to happen. Um, and I think you've seen that the sites that that is likely to happen come forward to that in the use, which is student housing. Um, you know, it, it, it's about basically the approach, but also tells you what can happen. We're not seeing the scheme, we're not accepting the alternative use on the other side. Thank you. Um, I think we should now move to uh, having our uh, um, speaker, um, who is Emma on Uh, to ensure that affordable housing is provided, what, what terms? 
do you have if you are not able to secure third party funding, be it in Newtown or other boards in the city? Yeah. So it's our intention to deliver all of the 11 apartments as affordable um, with no sexual and sex obligation. In doing so, if we're not successful with securing homes in the grant, we will still sell them to the local authority and the local council stock. So it's an absolute obligation that we will provide those 11 homes be utilised as formal homes and held by the council and the HRA. Um, can I just ask you I, I'm 
will be very happy to, uh, to propose when we get to the appropriate point, propose this recommendation. Um, and as far as um, Homes England are, are concerned, um, Emma has also quite, quite correctly said that there is, there is a guarantee that the Homes England will support this application. Um, I think Homes England um, blew in well to support it because they, 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 the clues in the name, uh, they are about assisting uh, local authorities to provide homes. And these are going to be um, remarkable homes. They're going to be built to a very high standard, uh, passive house standard. They are going to be significantly cheaper to run. Uh, um, standard apartments, they are built with building biology, uh, in a sustainable city centre location. Uh, Belmont Park is, is, you know, I think it would probably take you, uh, you know, a minute and a half to get to Belmont Park. It's really doable um, and it is right in the city centre. Um, if you need to get a bus um, to somewhere other than Exeter Road, would you? Um, you're a few minutes away from uh, Sidwell Street and the new bus station. Um, everything that you can need um, is, is within walking or cycling distance. Um, so I would recommend that uh, we approve this and enable the uh, um, exiting living to actually um, get on with delivering it and I wish them the best of luck for securing funding um, from Home England for the affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hall. Thank you, Councillor Hall. Um, it's very interesting to hear um, the replies on the ECLPQ Act and um, to hear the um, leaders speak about the council's commitment to the provision of affordable housing and I don't doubt any of that. I am really concerned that this would set a precedent and I understand the issue around the viability assessment. So I would support lifting of this section 106 agreement if a formal undertaking was attached to this approval from the council to confirm that it will have purchased um, the affordable homes in order to ensure that they are delivered. Councillor Hanford. 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 Councillor Hanford.
too many of this list. Stop this nonsense now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Councillor Brownstone. Uh, thank you. Um, this is a first rate application. It's, it's real quality. And I just would like to say that Councillor Sutton's presentation was first rate. I support her 100%. I have to second the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Thank you, Councillor Mitchell. 
I think that's a very helpful um, contribution and we will make sure that that is recorded in the minutes. Okay. So I think now that um, um, we don't have any further hands up, we will move to the vote. So I need to move to the Sorry? Sustainable Transport SPD 
uh, and we negotiated the inclusion of uh, space for family bicycles. Include say children's play space on site, uh, which would be a known as a lap area of play. It's not large enough to incorporate uh, a leap, which is a local equipped area of play. However, on the adjoining uh, main extra junction site, that was permitted back in May with a leap on it and would be within walking distance of this site. So our public and the Green Spaces team uh, asked for a condition that said that before this development can be occupied, that leap must have been provided. Uh, and I'll come on to, to that as the technical issue lies back before you this evening. Uh, the contr other contribution that we secured, um, 89,000 towards secondary education, uh, 64,000 towards the equal strategic recycle route, um, and the Stoke Hill roundabout, and 60,000 towards provision and improvement of offsite playing fields. This uh, shows the Bradford plan, which is also shown as side layout, with um, two separate accesses off the roundabout, just opposite Marion Morrison's, one of the vehicles and one of the pedestrians and cycles. Uh, and these are the plans that have been updated since it was last before you, so now uh, these plans on this slide show that all the boundaries, <coughs> sorry, all the apartments, except for those that face towards the South East, due to the uh, applicant not owning uh, at the core of the site, they will now have companies. And these are the revised elevation plans. Uh, this is the highways plan showing that a wreckage uh, vehicle could. Access the site, turn through 90 degrees and exit before it here for safety purposes. That's, uh, and these are just some of the images that haven't been updated since um, the revised plan showing the boundaries, but just to give a general idea of um, what the building will look like. This is just a list of consultees. Uh, there are no objections and exercise. Paying support of the application. And there were a few objections from the MI, um, the residents, 23 objections, um, one neutral, one in support. Um, and as a reminder, the objections, uh, there were concerns about the size of the building uh, and its impact on the amenity of the MI existing houses. Uh, and this is a the revised recommendation. Uh, this is the same as the recommendation we made back in April, except for inclusion of an uh, obligation of £80,000 on improving, improving existing offsite site areas serving the development if a leap has not been provided on the main expert junction site for occupation of the development. And that's to replace uh, condition 26, which would be removed. Condition 26 for a grounding condition requiring that leap to be provided before this development is occupied. Because the developer is concerned about that in terms of the funding, they requested that that condition is removed and that this obligation is added to the Section 106 agreement instead. I've discussed it with the Public Green Spaces team and they have agreed to it and uh, we've agreed to use some of £80,000 being an appropriate sum. Uh, so the recommendation uh, is to uh, approve the application subject to a section 106 agreement to secure these obligations as soon as shown on the screen and the conditions uh, which are included in the planning committee report. Happy to take any questions on this one. Do we have any questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, there is a long-standing request for a bus shelter at the bus stop just around the corner from this um, proposed development. Um, it's, it's been ongoing for some time, um, particularly from some of the staff that work there who corresponded with me and I've passed that on to the relevant county councillors and others. Um, is there any chance that we can, through this, get a bus shelter at that very busy location? Because I think it is really important 
you know, sustainability, you want, you know, the south should be able to get public transport to and from the site and the residents as well without getting to the level or whatever. So, so is there a chance that we can work with the powers that be? I can forward you the correspondence if necessary to, um, to speed matters up, but a bus shelter at that location would be very welcome. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, it's not been accounted for in the, uh, the obligation that's been agreed. Um, as we've only made the application, we've consulted the local highway authorities. So they've effectively dictated what access to highways contributions that will be secured. As you can see from the screen, um, this development would secure uh, some very good obligations in terms of improving the sustainable transport in the area. Um, there is a, a safety issue with this circular roundabout uh, because this development would generate additional movement on the roundabout. That effectively absorbs some of the some of the contributions that might otherwise go towards um, bus shelters. So, yeah, I, I cannot um, advise members to include it because it's not something that the highway authority have requested. Uh, it's not something that's been agreed with the, uh, the applicant, right? <coughs> Chair, can I absolutely ask that that, that is at least investigated? And, and uh, because I think there is a, a perception that throughout they may be able to get some leverage and contributions from the rest of the development as well because, because <coughs> it, it, it will feed into that area. So, as I said, I'm happy to forward on the correspondence and you know, if, if you can see these have a look at it. Thank you. Um, I understand the, the request for the developer um, to remove um, this requirement because the land which was previously um, in, in their control is, is um, all the part of the same development is no longer it's two separate developments. And I think I'm correct on that. Um, my question is. Does the provision of the, um, the leap still remain a condition of the other part of the site? Um, the, I'm just trying to ask for my, uh, the permission uh, that was granted back in May for the main interjection site was an outline application, so the drawings indicate a place space within the, the open space on that site. Um, I think it's always been uh, understood and uh, expected that a, a formal leave would have to be provided on that site. Um, there are uh, reserve matters that have been submitted and through the reserve matters we'll be insisting on a effectively a policy compliant leap is, is delivered on that site, so I think that's well understood on, on both sides. Uh, and you are right, um, I think technically, I think the applicant may have been slightly different on these two sites, just in the, in the way that um, these developers produce different company names and whatnot. Um, but I was certainly dealing with the same people um, back in May, um, but you are right that the excellent junction uh, main developers you take your homes have now sold part of the main excellent junction site to another developer that's uh, effectively the cause of their concern that they don't know what the control of the land in question. Thank you. I, I, I think that's helpful. I, I, as I say, I think it's difficult to, to um, see a reason not to, um, to agree to this request because, you know, the, the applicants are not able to do it. But if, if, you know, we're developing one of six Somebody providing it, and I think that's sufficiently reassured. Thank you. Councillor Mitchell? Thank you, Chair. I just turned, uh, returned to a point I tried to raise earlier. This development just can't for 51 units of accommodation on the site and no ability to have residential parking, uh, residential parking permits. We earlier considered another development for 40, which is even closer to the town centre with parking facilities. So what criteria do a planning team use in determining what is car free and what is not car free? Um, well, 
I think we and the county council work together and look at each site and we will um, happily accept proposals for car free um, uh, developments and we would look at what uh, sustainable transport modes are available in the locality. So on this one, um, we're next to the E4 strategic site route. Um, there's bus services going up and down there. Um, obviously it's within easy walking distance of the main supermarket and um, various local centres and the main city centres. So we were happy to accept this as a car free scheme. Um, we don't have a policy position where we can you know, enforce having car free in certain areas of the city. We're, we're in a position where we have to look at each application site on its, its merits uh, and decide whether car free is going to be appropriate or might not be appropriate. Thank you. I'd like to open the application to any debate. Would anyone like to speak? You can take that as a no. Um, given that the, oh, hello. Hello, <laughs> Rob. Can I plan with approval? You may. Oh, and seconded. By Councillor Violet, given that we in principle have approved this development earlier in the year and that we are going to get by the sound of things somewhere to play somewhere near that site, um, I'd be happy to support the recommendation for that. Again. So, all of those in favour? Thank you. Okay, item number eight is the list of decisions made and withdrawn. Uh, you've got a report in front of you by Richard Marsh. Does anyone have any comments or questions? Not aware of any that have been sent to you. And you also have a list of decisions made, uh, the appeals report, sorry. Um, question for sure. Okay. Right and nine. Yeah. I don't know a lot of places in Exeter, obviously. But can just somebody frequent me with exactly where? Unit 6, Exbridge Centre, Coach Street is. Is it different from bang next door to the last stop uh, by the shopping centre? Is it different? That's for the yes. Other My other understanding, other. having discussed this with Roger Crockett, is that the application that we previously reviewed in St Thomas remains refused. And that further application was made on a slightly different site, which was refused by officers. Uh, because they didn't have the time to get an option and extension to bring it to committee, they refused it based on previous comments, and that that is what has been appealed here. But I'm willing for any officer to tell me anything I've got wrong with that. Are they still about Poundland? I mean, I understand where Poundland is, that's the unit six, I'm not sure. We're talking to Poundland, there's a nod, so I'm going to yeah. give it a yes. Poundland, that's absolutely fine, Chair. Thank you, Howard. And does any, we also suggested that uh, these people putting in these various things may want to just have all they've got permitted rights and all that development rights, but may wish to have a chat with us before they go around sticking these poles up all over the place uh, about the strategic vision of the city. Um, the question that may be for another, but perhaps I'll ask the officer direct on that, but I just want to say I don't think we should lose that call. I'll no, say I think, I think we have had meetings with some providers about similar Okay, and the final item on the agenda tonight is the site inspection party, which will be on Tuesday the 30th of November at 9.30am, and that will be myself, Councillor Williams, and Councillor Wyatt, the Drew team. Thank you everybody for staying with us for this long, thank you for your work tonight.